Diabetes insipidus is a disorder characterized by the passage of large volumes, that is more than 3 liters per 24 hours, of dilute urine with an osmolality of less than 300 milliosmoles per kilogram. There are various forms of diabetes insipidus, but the two major forms are central and nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Central diabetes insipidus is a disorder of the neurohypophyseal system, which results in partial or total antidiuretic hormone deficiency. Nephrogenic diabetes insipidus occurs as a result of renal resistance to the action of antidiuretic hormone. Other types of diabetes insipidus include gestational diabetes insipidus, which occurs in pregnancy due to an enzyme produced by the placenta, which destroys antidiuretic hormone. Dipsogenic diabetes insipidus occurs due to a dysfunction of the thirst mechanism in the hypothalamus. In this video, we will be discussing the two major forms of diabetes insipidus, namely central diabetes insipidus and nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Let's start off with central diabetes insipidus and its causes. It's usually caused by neoplastic or infiltrative lesions of the hypothalamus or pituitary gland. In the hypothalamus, these lesions can be secondary to adenomas, craniopharyngiomas, etc. Whereas in the pituitary gland, adenomas, leukemia, or sarcoid histiocytosis can lead to diabetes insipidus. Other causes of central diabetes insipidus include surgery, radiotherapy, severe head injuries, anoxia, hypertension, and meningitis. It could occur due to infections such as encephalitis, tuberculosis, or syphilis. It could be idiopathic diabetes insipidus, which usually starts in childhood. Moving on to the next major form of diabetes insipidus, and that is nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. It could be idiopathic, or it could be secondary to hypercalcemia, hypokalemia, sickle cell disease, amyloidosis, myeloma, pyelonephritis, Sjogren's syndrome, sarcoidosis, or drugs, such as lithium, colchicine, and demeclocycline. So how does diabetes insipidus present clinically? Well, patients present with polyuria, which is excessive urination, and polydipsia, which is excessive thirst, and patients consume about 16 to 20 liters of water per day. Lab tests reveal hypernatremia with high serum osmolarity and coexisting low urine osmolarity and low urine specific gravity. Nocturia is expected in such patients. Differentials of diabetes insipidus include psychogenic polydipsia, drug-induced polydipsia from chlorpromazine or anticholinergics, and hypothalamic diseases. How do we diagnose a case of diabetes insipidus? Well, in addition to measuring serum electrolytes and glucose, the water deprivation test is used, which basically helps distinguish diabetes insipidus from other causes of excessive urination. This test measures changes in urine output and composition when fluids are withheld to induce dehydration. The body's normal response to dehydration is that it conserves water and produces concentrated urine, but in case of diabetes insipidus, the body will continue to produce large volumes of dilute urine in spite of dehydration. Water deprivation tests can also help distinguish between central and nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Desmopressin stimulation is used to distinguish between the two types. Desmopressin is a vasopressin analog which functions to conserve water. Administering desmopressin in central diabetes insipidus reduces urine output and increases urine osmolarity since hypothalamic production of antidiuretic hormone is deficient and the kidney is responding normally to exogenous vasopressin. In case of nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, desmopressin does not change urine output or osmolarity since endogenous vasopressin levels are already high. This graph here shows the changes in urine osmolality before and after desmopressin administration. The yellow shaded area shows the change in urine osmolality after desmopressin administration. In a person with central diabetes insipidus, the urine osmolality shows a sudden rise since hypothalamic production of antidiuretic hormone is deficient, but the kidneys are functioning normally. In case of nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, there is no change in urine osmolality since the kidneys are not responding to antidiuretic hormone. In primary polydipsia, desmopressin does not cause any change in urine osmolality. 
So how can we manage a case of diabetes insipidus? In case of central diabetes insipidus, hormone replacement with vasopressin subcutaneously or desmopressin either intranasally or by oral tablets proves to be effective. Drugs that stimulate antidiuretic hormone secretion such as carbamazepine, chlorpropamide and clofibrate can also be used. For managing nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, thiazide diuretics are used, which reduce distal convoluted tubule reabsorption of sodium and chloride by blocking the sodium and chloride co-transporter. This promotes natriuresis and diuresis, which leads to decreased plasma volume and low GFR. Low GFR, or glomerular filtration rate, enhances absorption of sodium and water in the proximal nephron. As a result, less fluid reaches the distal nephron and overall fluid conservation is obtained. Amyloride, which is a potassium-sparing diuretic, is used in conjunction with thiazide diuretics to prevent hypokalemia, and it also blocks additional sodium uptake. 